What we were wondering is, um, how do you incentivize those students who, you know, once the program is over, or and there's not the thirty thousand dollars, or those if you have kind of a split program, you said some are funded and some are not. How do you incentivize them and their advisors and their departments to encourage them to participate? <coughs> Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for students, I think uh, being told that these are job qualities that people are hiring for is very incentivizing to continue developing those. Um, and I don't know about faculty. I also think for students, maybe it's a very focused microphone. FYI, um, maybe reducing. So the courses, each course that we took was a full semester course. So you're talking about essentially an, an entire semester's worth of a course load that you're requesting. So maybe re being able to reduce that down to mini courses, webinars, workshops, things like that, where um, people don't necessarily have to eat away a huge chunk of their, their own degree progress um, and still be able to engage with the material in a useful way. So we have been focusing a lot on the students, but maybe a faculty member would like to respond. Oh, yeah. Anybody? And also, I, yeah. I w I'm wondering if you, if you all had not had the incentive of the, you know, um, research assistantship support, would having someone come in and a and give a talk to you on this help me get a job, would that have, t you know, I mean, is that what would have worked as far as specific strategies? I came to NC State and enrolled in a doctoral program called Communication Digital Red or Communication Rhetoric and Digital Media. I'm sorry, I'm sleepy. I have a seven-month-old baby. <laughs> um, I came to study uh, online learning, and was here for a year, and um, was friends with Molly Hartzog, who was in the previous cohort. And she said, "Oh, I know you're interested in interdisciplinary learning." I'm, do you want to come to this happy hour with people who do interdisciplinary stuff? And that's how I <laughs> fell into IGERT. Um, it wasn't for the fellowship, actually. I sat down at the happy hour, and I happened to be across the table from Fred and from Alan Lloyd. And the kinds of things that they were talking about were so interesting. And also, I, was, I, I looked around myself, and I saw that the percent, the ratio of faculty to students and faculty who wanted to work and talk to students individually was almost one to one, and that was amazing. Um, so for me, it was much more the intellectual appeal. And then, you know, I the the resources were amazing, not just the stipend, but also, you know, it, it to be able to sustain a collaboration like Jen said, right? Like there's the steep learning curve, but then then you can really do exciting stuff. Um, so, so that certainly made a difference. Um, sorry, the only other thing is to, to recruit somebody to, to um, it helps to keep the problem vague, which can be frustrating, but, but it, it, I think it helps with students to let them find their own way in. Because if you over-prescribe it, you're gonna alienate people and you're also gonna shut down cool projects you couldn't anticipate in advance. Uh, that's exactly what we talked about at our table and thinking about uh, the diversity of how interdisciplinary thinking operates and if you're coming in and we understand this is a funding issue if you're coming in and it sounds like you're probably not the person I want to hear from but because you emerged out of a program that was here and were inspired by it in a different way I'm, I'm curious how students were recruited to this program and thinking about I'm going to be working with other students on a program or a problem in advance. And I heard your word frustration, and I was curious about, does that fr did some of that frustration come out of the fact that you, some of you may have thought it was too vague, and some of you thought maybe it was not vague enough? Or not vague at all. <laughs> Jen, and J Jen and Jace, I think you two were the ones that actually joined at joined NC State at the same time as the program, right? No, I, I was here a year before I joined. Never mind. As I was as, I was as well. So um, I would say, yeah, you know, 
define, I think we're all interested, you know, so was it vague or not vague, you know, we're all interested in genetic, genetically modified organisms and I think their interactions with society. We, we came from different perspectives, you know, from a bench scientist trying to understand, you know, is my, is my technology going to be accepted to somebody like me from policy process saying, um, will, will society accept it, will the regulator accept it, those types of things. So I think, I think the, vague, the vagueness was good. There was, there, there was an underlying interest in genetically modified organisms that I think probably pulled all of us into it. And if that didn't, that didn't exist, you probably weren't interested in coming into the program. So there was some baseline, some baseline ideas there. Uh, my name is Mike Jones. I'm with the third cohort in uh, agricultural insect pests. So I, I will say, I as much as I, you know, have talked at our table about the real tangible costs of going through this training program and you know the ex maybe extending your you know training time and whatnot. I was recruited to North Carolina State as an institution because of the IGER program. I had worked in my master's degree with entomologists pretty extensively on storage pest economics in developing countries. It kind of almost hilariously fit like the line item that was going on there, even though it sort of morphed uh, into what I uh, ended up focusing on. But I don't think I actually would have come to North Carolina State if the um, ability of the IGER program to provide that collaborate, collaborative space um, wasn't there. And you know, the financial incentives were, were real. It is. I mean, you are thinking about how you're going to support yourself through your graduate process. Um, but it was a, a, a guaranteed ability to continue that very interesting collaboration that makes the graduate experience rich because as fun as economists are all the time, it gets a little dry sometimes. So it's, it's really fun to play uh, with other disciplines. So that was important for me. Do any other students or faculty from the program want to comment? I would just say that, you know, when we came up with this uh, in our faculty meetings, we thought we'd have an easy time recruiting students from elsewhere. And um, I remember going to an Ivy League school where I thought, oh, these students love, in, you know, like they're coming from these backgrounds where they had double majors in science and humanities and all that, and they would love the opportunity. And I gave a talk, and they set aside a special time for the students to come to talk to me, and nobody showed up. So I, I do want to say, I mean, it's a good point. I think today it would be easier than in 2011 to do that recruiting, but I don't know. I think that, you know, those si it's amazing. You know, you would think that those silos weren't so strong, but I also think that when undergraduates look at graduate school, they see that, that track, they know all about it, and they think that's the way to go to get you know, out the other end and get that academic job that they see as a hurdle. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that recruiting piece and the faculty. Okay, all right, next table. Three. We just had a you, discussion. We had no you have no questions, all right, four. First of all, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. So the question for us is, um, you had a, a significant amount of time to develop the relationships, to learn from each other, to develop that team. And most of the time, we don't have that time and that kind of background. So what skills did you develop that can give us some advice to, uh, to the rest of us as the main skills that are required to put a, that kind of team mentality in a more short period of time? Uh, Um, <clears throat> Fred was, Fred was uh, very generous with his funding and one of the things he allowed us to do for about two years is we would about once every three months or so or we would go out to lunch and Fred would buy lunch for us, right? And it was the, I, is the Eigert cohort lunch and I, that was super, super, super f fun. It was a good meal and we, we just, we got to know each other f outside of the Eigert and I think that that helped us build a lot of that collaboration. So. 
get, give people the opportunity to, to spend some time together, break some bread together. You know, and I know also the trips that people went on were very strong building things. I mean, our cohort gets together maybe once or twice a year where we'll just go over to somebody's house and just sit down and talk. We message each other, do all those types of things. So, get, you know, don't, don't leave out the people aspects of building those relationships, building that social capital between each other. I think that that's very, very important. that and say that I think that in many aspects I feel closer to my cohort and the other cohorts um, than some people in my own department um, and that the trip to California really solidified us um, in that kind of way and I think that was two weeks we were gone um, so two weeks might seem like a lot of time um, but front we have lasting um, working relationships and even friendships from those two weeks so I mean if I'm oh, sorry if you if you can make the time, that's <laughs> huge. But um, you know, also the colloquium that Fred was talking about is you know Tuesdays from twelve to one, so one hour a week. If you can get people to attend that regularly, which actually everyone gets so busy, it can be tempting not to. But if you can even incentivize just that, you know, over time you build some community. And I think that's what I'm saying, yeah, you're, you can, uh, I you, think you're just uh, you're asking you you new you and you're going to be working with a lot of people that you have never met. And, and you're going to be asked to form these teams. So you don't have time for the socialization. So what is the skill that you, that you basically bring around the table with five people that you haven't met and bring them together? What is the skill that you need and how would you help us or give us some advice? I think being able to um, cross-communicate is the number one thing. And so if you have a few hours in a day to be able to have everyone put together a five, 10 minute presentation about the research that they do. And you have everybody communicate that to each other because what you learn really quickly when you do those is, I don't know any of the words you just said. <laughs> and you get that from, ev from every discipline. If you, have, if you have five different disciplines, no one is gonna understand each other for, for at least parts of what's being said. Um, and you really quickly learn to break down for yourself you know, how do I explain what opportunity cost is? How do I explain, you know, sunken cost fallacy? You know, you have, everybody has these jargon terms that they don't even know that they have until they say it to someone who isn't in their discipline. Um, so being able to just have a one-day workshop where you break down those terms would be really helpful. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, going through the IGERT process taught me, it's, it's always the same things that trip other people up. So it taught me, oh, okay, well, if I say linkage map, well, no one knows what that is. And so I, I know I have to say, oh, I'm looking at the s associations between two different places in the genome. Like that's, you know, just breaking it down and using common language to help get across these complex ideas. And so going through the IGERT in this process, I now default to the simpler explanation than the technical explanation. And I think going forward, going into new groups, that that's going to facilitate interdisciplinary work a lot. The, the other thing is it can be, it's so easy to assume, especially in people who are becoming experts, that, that you think that communication is about explaining yourself more clearly. There's also the part of being quiet and listening um, so, you know, a simple exercise that goes a long way is encouraging people who are used to talking all the time to slow down and, and make sense of what each other person at the table is saying and try and, like, repeat that back because otherwise everyone's so busy explaining that you're still talking past each other a little bit. Hi, I'm Nora Hahn. I'm one of the co-PIs on the original IGERT. And I want to say that um, we thought long and hard about this socialization question. So it's what they're saying here is not an accident. We drew from uh, our colleagues in communication who said that when you have controversial topics and you have people on um, who are polarized on it, the way to get them to talk to each other is to make some kind of personal connection. So um, I would say in answer to your question, if it is a controversial topic, the socialization 
aspect is non-negotiable. Um, you have to have lunches. We have lunch uh, every semester for the very first time. And with our colloquium speakers, um, we have a kind of introduction where we ask them to share a little bit about their personal, like how they came into this uh, topic. So if we're not with them on the topic itself, we might find something interesting in their educational background and their family background or something like that. So this has been something we have really thought about. And um, Elizabeth just hinted at another conversation we had endlessly about do we talk too much or do we talk not enough? Are people not putting um, things on the table? Um, I don't think we have a magic formula for that, but over time it kind of worked itself out because we did build those interpersonal relationships and some of us learned to talk a little less. <laughs> what yeah. table is it? Table five? Oh, you. Oh, we're ready. While he's coming up, I'll just reiterate some of what N Nora said. And it's uh, when you're actually doing the hard work, it's it's really hard to be mean to someone you like. So if you've put in the time up front to make those relationships, you're going to hold your tongue and not hurt someone as, you know, a little bit more. So I'm Ron Sederoff. I'm a retired professor of genetics. Um, I'm so old that I remember when DNA was not an accepted um, science. With it, what we believe is the structure of DNA, one professor said, well, those experiments are controversial. Those preparations weren't very clean, and it should take some time before we take this double helix model too seriously. So that's where that's where I come from. Uh, a word about the, the conference so far. I'm really tremendously impressed with the way people have worked together to develop interdisciplinarity is one of the most difficult things we struggle with at our university because everyone um, has the idea that they work on the most important thing in the world because if it wasn't the most important thing, something else was, that's what they would be doing. <laughs> so, um, and so it, it's with great difficulty we cross these disciplinary ba barriers and we do so um, um, not very, not always very successfully. Uh, what I struggle with is the extent to which and in a way, I applaud the perspective which deals with controversial issues where everyone is considered to come in with a, with a sense of bias and that everyone has a bias. But I struggle with that because I think that gives equivalency to things that don't always deserve it. That I think what is important to resolving discussions is to agree on common standards by which evidence can be evaluated. And if you don't agree on common standards at the beginning, you have no way to fundamentally resolve a specific issue because there's no, it's, it's like there's no law by which you can say this fits the law or if it doesn't fit the law. And so the idea that pro-GMO, for example, and anti-GMO have equivalents distresses me because on one sense it's settled science. In the other sense, it's considered to be invalid evidence. And we haven't solved that problem. And that's the problem which has to be addressed before you can, before, before a problem is fundamentally resolved. So I struggle with that. Response? Do, do anybody want to respond? Um, I think about this too. Uh, when I taught in the fall, I had a unit on uh, vaccines and um, was also pregnant with a child and f felt very strongly that I didn't want him growing up in a world where, you know, he could get polio or Zika or, 
you know, uh, Zika is not a good example, diseases that have been eradicated that are coming back. Um, I study communication, and that pursuit has made me give up the idea of a, a universal law that we all will submit to. Um, but what I can tell you is that, um, you know, our political situation is a good example of this. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that all perspectives are equally valid. I would say that if you don't treat the opposing view with respect, the, contra the controversy and the conflict will only get worse. Yeah, I think early on we all kind of struggled with that. So our white paper ended up being, you know, the question, should transgenics be used to suppress dengue? And we had such a hard time even answering that question. And kind of the best we could do is lay out the the variety of perspectives. And I think it's one of the things that frustrated me too coming from uh, math and biology. I think that with the very first class that we took on ethics, we went around and kind of, you know, talked about our, our feelings about it. And mine was, it's frustrating that there's not an answer. You know, sometimes the most you can do is discuss these and discuss the variety of perspectives. Um, but I, I think it's an impossible task to come up with a list of things that if A, B, and C, then yes, or if A, B, and C, then no. Um, so it's something that I think we all continue to struggle with and not anything that we have resolved necessarily, but I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. Okay, table six. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Table seven. You pass, okay, table eight. Anything else? Yeah, and table nine. All right. Okay. Good people weren't passing because they're hungry. One thing I guess I'm wondering about is for all of you, just because this is an area, genetic engineering, which has been sort of racing forward over the past several years. But you all started, actually, before most people other than uh, microbiologists had ever heard of CRISPR. Um, in that context, like a really good program would help students in terms of, uh, as they go forward, face problems that are in front of us. But I think a really great one probably would help address problems we don't even know exist yet or we haven't thought about. And so has your iGER experience perhaps um, contributed to that, helped you? You think it's made a difference that way? I mean, from the perspective of, uh, so, so basically in my job, I do project work and I'll have four to five projects at a time and they'll rotate and projects last anywhere from a few months to a couple of years. And so my subject matter that I'm tackling is constantly shifting. Um, and I think that IGERT, made me more adaptable um, in thinking that that nothing should be out of reach of being something that should be considered um, and that that policy issues and ethical issues and social issues often have a common ground no matter what new thing you're talking about. Um, the specifics are gonna vary from thing to thing, but you're always wondering about social, economic, personal ramifications or benefits or, and, um, and so learning to, to use that common thread and then work in the specifics for each individual thing is almost sort of just icing on the cake, but, but learning that general concept of this is how we think about these issues has been really pivotal and helpful to me. So my question is, as far as recruiting for a program like this, and maybe for some others, it seems where there's a controversial topic, it really gets people from different viewpoints and to think about an interdisciplinary approach. But what about for other, maybe not so controversial topics within the context of the university setting? where it makes really sense to have 
a much more interdisciplinary and collaborative approach. Maybe comment on, on recruiting for something like that. <coughs> well, I'll talk about my experience of getting into the IGERT because I came to NC State and I'm going to be a geneticist and I'm going to study something that wasn't related to the IGERT. And um, we, our program has rotations. And so uh, one of my last rotation was with Fred. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I want to know more about this. It's really intriguing. And so I, th I, th I understand wanting to go out and bring bright, good students in. But I think every school has really good talent within the university. And so looking at people who might not have realized that the opportunity existed um, might be a really good way to find uh, good applicants, if I can say that I was good. But um, yeah, so I think not only recruiting from outside, but also looking from within and just finding people who may not have realized that it was, that it was a choice. I just want to say that this afternoon, we're going to hear from a number of other programs at other d universities, many of which are dealing with exactly the kinds of situations you're talking about. So I think this is just one example of an interdisciplinary program. And I do agree with you. There's a different motivation when you're dealing with something this controversial than one that is not, because you still have the same barriers to talking the same language and all of that. Um, are there any other comments from the group, other questions somebody want to ask? Okay, and I just wanted to say, is, is there anything that you folks want to add that we didn't ask you? Um, so just two things to add, um, and one we've kind of probably all briefly touched on this, but just to directly say thank you, Fred. Um, you've been a huge uh, inspiration um, and support for all of us. Um, and the second thing, I'm just going to add this um, NC State slogan is think and do, um, and I'm going to add listen, then think and do. Right. And anything else? I think if you want to talk about later, I, if I had had twice the time in my presentation, I would have been really interested in talking about how broadly interdisciplinary collaboration um, can increase the participation of women and underrepresented groups in science. There's evidence for that. Um, and I think that's a really important conversation to have, too, um, if anybody would like to have it later or continue throughout the day. Okay, anything I think else? Something, I guess, it may be more of a discussion for tomorrow, but food for thought. We focus a lot, we're focusing a lot right now on us as students, but I think a big thing for recruitment and sustainability of programs is to actually start with faculty because we all have faculty in our own departments that we have to answer to, like, for, to get your degree, you have to please those faculty first and foremost. So making sure that those faculty are on board with the project that you're doing. And I was recruited by faculty that I had engaged with. Um, so it, it was because faculty had been reached out to, and then they reached out to me through our relationships. 